Jared Poland, froknowsphoto.com. Welcome to a different type of Raw Talk, episode number 85. Why am I coming to you sitting at the table just by myself without Stevens here to do anything and why? Because I am currently in Israel, so I wasn't at home to sit around and make a podcast, but we have one from the Fro Kives. It's an interview of me. I am being being interviewed by Robert Kaplan for or uh yeah basically for the Photo Brigade. He has a website called the Photo Brigade where he interviews other people and it's a nice conglomerate of photographers. But Robert Kaplan is a great photographer. Toured with Bieber, uh, works I believe for the New York Times. Really cool guy. And we met up with him. When I say we, Stephen Eckert and I met up with him after our interview with what's his name Joey L. And we met with Robert at a sushi restaurant where he was interviewing me. Now, this was such a good interview. He did a very, very good job asking questions to bring out the right responses from me. I love quality interviews when people ask the right questions. So it's not often where I sit down and have somebody interview me, but I thought the information in it was so good and it's going to give you a lot of insight into the history of Frono's photo uh, and just honestly answering really good questions that I wanted to save it to share it with you guys when there was a time where I wasn't able to make an actual Fronos Photo Raw Talk. And I didn't want to leave you guys hanging with nothing left to watch. So what you're about to hear, because if you're watching on YouTube right now, you're not going to see anything other than the Fronos Photo Raw Talk logo because we didn't shoot video of this because it was for Robert. You're going to hear us eating sushi, not just eating sushi for an hour, but you're going to hear this interview that Robert conducted with me for the Photo Brigade, and we're calling this Raw Talk episode number 85. It's me being interviewed, so go ahead and enjoy. Hello, and welcome to the Photo Brigade podcast. I'm Hello. Robert. Hello. Hello, Jared. I'm with uh, Jared Pollen of Frono's Photo. I've just uh, always loved hearing you say that. That was... That's key, right? Not there. everybody does. Well, I get people telling me to stop, or I'll never listen to your videos again. Yeah. Well, uh, Jared uh, runs this uh, pretty cool website called uh, FronosPhoto.com, and uh, I want to sort of chat with you. About, how you doing? I'm good. We're up in New York today. We're having some sushi. Yeah, we're we're it's here. It's not the only a, reason I came up to New York, but one of, one of my favorite sushi restaurants called Tenzan here on the Upper West Side. Used to live right next door to it, and. Uh, I don't know. I got sick of it because I ate it so much, but uh, now that I'm bringing you, I want you to have the good stuff. Thank you, because uh, I know that my sushi restaurant at home in Philly is not open on Sunday. Oh, really? Well, what's wrong with that? That's crazy. I don't know what it is. Well, well anyways, uh, uh, you run this uh, website, Frodo's Photo, which is sort of like a, a gearhead's uh, website. and uh, Less gear. Less gear. More tutorials. Uh, fun. I... I equated to fun and informative videos that keep people coming back for more. Try not to do too much gear stuff. I mean, I do gear stuff, but try not to really focus on that because I want to keep it fun and informative. Right. But there is a lot of gear for the gear heads if they want to oh, come if they to want it, they want it. You, you know, there's the sniff tests and the wind tunnel tests and the reviews and things like that. Um, we get into it, uh -huh. but it's not strictly because it's not about the gear. Right. It's about what you do with the gear. Yeah. So absolutely. Yeah. And uh, you know, on top of the website, you're uh, accomplished photographer yourself. Um, I'd say you specialize in the music industry. Yeah. Yeah. Photojournalism, more so the candid nature of whoever I'm photographing. Just so happens that musicians and celebrities are interesting mm -hmm. because they, they give you that shot. Because, but there's nothing wrong with going and shooting a uh, like a, an accountant, sure. but showing their story. Because if you can capture an accountant and tell their story in photos, then you're probably doing something right. That's true, absolutely. Um, so do you prefer, uh, you, you, you do a lot of portraiture as well, but do you prefer uh, more of the documentary, the, the uh, on stage action or the portraiture work? It's more of the candid behind the scenes. Yeah. Anybody can shoot live. Yeah. I mean, you know this. It's like shooting ducks in a bit. Yeah. It's the same people shooting in the pit every night, three songs, getting out, same angles, nothing very unique. But when you start getting on the road with the artists and you start uh, asking for permission to do things that other people don't, mm -hmm. that's when you get access to what makes the historic images. Not saying what I'm creating is historic by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just thinking back to the, the Annie Leibovitzes of the day going behind the scenes and, and living the road and, and yeah. Jim Marshall and uh, Bob Gruen, those people doing what they did. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they were doing some amazing stuff. And you were just uh, talking, uh, you can listen to Bob on your podcast. Yeah, we did a, I came up to New York just to talk to him and I asked literally two questions the whole time and he just talked for 30 minutes, well, the, which is great. Folks like them have uh, some crazy stories. Yeah, 
And we're not too far from, I guess, where John and Yoko lived? Yeah, we just passed, uh, what's it called? The, uh, oh crap, I'm forgetting the name of the building now, but uh, I'll add that in in post. Okay. Um, so anyways, we're, we're sitting down to food, so you might hear some uh, chomping away, and I, I hope that the uh, listeners don't mind too much. But uh, there it is, Wait, chopsticks. <laughs> All right, sorry. <laughs> Sound effects. Um, but uh, can you tell me a little bit about uh, your background and, and how you got into this uh, photo industry? Sure. I mean, photography first before Frono's photo was, yeah. uh, I was 13, uh-huh. uh, and I was in junior high school, and I was at a, one of the basketball games, and noticed that the yearbook, quote unquote, girls were shooting photos of the warm-ups and things that I felt, if you're gonna shoot sports, then you need to get the action. Totally. You, need to, you need to be there. So instead of telling them that they were doing the wrong thing and that they weren't any good, I basically uh, went home, grabbed my mom's Fuji Discovery, I believe it's Fuji Discovery 2000 point and shoot camera, maybe it's even a 1000, loaded it up with a black and white roll of film and just started shooting. And there was something about, you, you press the button, it doesn't shoot right away. Right. You, so I had to learn the anticipation of that camera to, to pre-visualize what I wanted and press it right before because I knew it would happen. So there was just something that you could see in the images that I was capturing the moment, the framing, the composition. I say this with people all the time. I don't care, I'm big, I shoot raw, get out of auto. When you're first starting out, if all you focus on is shooting images and getting the composition right mm -hmm. and focusing on just seeing the world through the camera, you can learn how to get out of auto later. Right. You can do all of that because that's, that's, the, that's the easy stuff, but it's very hard to teach people about the eye. Right. But once you, if you have that, and that's something that I had when I was, still have, but you know, noticed when I was younger that the eye was there and it took a long time to figure out the settings. But that ends up happening over time. Sure. So sure. That, that's where I got my start with the, with, uh, sports or, or photography was then and then three about three years later I started shooting the Philadelphia Flyers for some magazines and oh, I had cool. a season credential as a 16 year old kid basically living almost famous just in in, yeah. in the, in the yeah, hockey world. world yeah yeah um so I, I hung out in the sports world for a while and that's pretty much locked up unless you're working for the NHL or, or yeah, somebody nowadays, these days. Yeah, the Getty contracts right. and whatnot. Which, which is fine, but those Getty photographers, they literally, they shoot every night, they shoot 41 games a year at home because uh -huh. it's 82 game season and they just turn everything over, they get a paycheck. Yep. So it's not the same as it was. Um, through college, is this good? Keep talking? Yeah, yeah, good, keep good. talking, man. Through college, um, Almost Famous came out. Mm -hmm. I graduated high school in 99, and uh, did a two year photography school and while I was there, where'd you go? It was called Antonelli Institute. Okay. It's one of those nobody knows it, but they call themselves the third ranked or second ranked. It's probably a third ranked. I don't know. It's a small school up in, in PA. Um, it, schools don't matter though. It's it's about the teachers that are actually there Absolutely. teaching you. So, I had some really good professor professors. I still did a half-ass job because I, it wasn't real. It was practice. Yeah. And I always I don't my thing was. Unless it was the real deal, the game, I'm not giving my all. And that's well, just one of my downfalls. Well, I, but. I found uh, a lot, I mean, I also went through college at Ohio University, and, and I found that the most experience that I got was on internships, you know, doing the real thing. Hands-on um, learning. And, you know, there's so many students at any college, you know, they have their 10 assignments uh, per quarter or per semester. And uh, what ends up happening is they just shoot those 10 assignments and that's it. But working for a regular publication, you know, you're constantly practicing, you're shooting, you know, 10 times as much as oh, the yeah. students around you. Or even if you're not shooting, you're watching guys on jobs. You know, you're watching the, the, the mentor or whoever you're assisting for do the job. You're learning real world stuff. You still need to get out and shoot. Yeah, absolutely. It comes down to shooting. I mean, absolutely. that's what school is. You're paying somebody to give you assignments. In this day and age, you can go online and find so much information, uh, not saying that, that you know, I, I have this debate all the time with people. Should we go to school? Should we not go to school? It depends on the person. It mm -hmm. depends on where you're at as a in your uh, maturity level. But just assisting and getting out there and shooting is, is the most important. So, so you mentioned sports. Uh, like you, I, I got into sports early. That was my same same sort of thing for the yearbook. I was shooting for the yearbook yep. and, and really got into sports. I ended up selling pictures of the of the kids to the parents. That's what I did exactly that way. Started with like, hey. I'll shoot a roll and then give you the roll afterwards, and then it turned into splitting the roll, and then it turned into me developing it and selling the prints and yeah. learning that business business uh, savvy at a young age. Yeah. Um, and then uh, internships, I, I ended up interning. My last internship was at the New York Times and was shooting the Yankees and whatnot. 
but I kind of got sick of sports. Did you get sick of sports? Yeah, well, it was the same repetitive thing. It was, it was the, like, like shooting a live show, right? Everything happens the same. I mean, sports is different because it's gonna, it's gonna change, mm -hmm. and concerts are generally the same thing time and time again, but it's just every day shooting the same type of images, shooting, coming out and shooting the action shots. And then I had one professor, one teacher in school that was like, look behind you. Mm -hmm. There's a whole world of other things going on at the hockey rink. And when I did that, that opened, that was what my, uh, I guess I, I'm, I'm, I was about to go back to an interview I gave earlier today and, and come up with that. But basically back in high school, I had a teacher who was trying to kick my ass into gear to try to get me to do something other than action shots. It right. didn't work in college, uh, in high school. But then I guess a, a, a professor in college phrased it differently and, and it opened my eyes. And then I thought back to that and I was like, wow, that really does make a difference. Ooh, mm -hmm. sushi. Ooh, oh, anyway. box, nice. So, um, oh, that looks really good. So, where was I going? So, uh, we were talking did about- Did I get tired of sports? Yeah, did you get tired of sports? And when, yeah. did you, when did you kind of transition from sports to more music? Yeah, sports was, it was, it was in college. And like I said, when Almost Famous came out, that kind of said, I want to tour with bands. Nice, I yeah. want to figure out how to get into that world. And, and I slowly, slowly worked my way in. Um, but the sports does get, Repetitive. So the, the professor's like, look behind you. And that's when I saw the daughter, the, you know, like a four-year-old kid with her dad at the game. And there's a nice portrait of her with him in the background and nice wide shots and action shots from afar. Just something different. And that's there's what so I think sports There's so many stories to be told around the event itself. Oh, yeah. It's the behind-the-scenes moments. Mm -hmm. And that's what music has afforded me to do. And that's, you know, getting into music was... Uh, I don't know, my first show I ever shot was the Counting Crows Hard Candy Tour in 2002, shooting film. Mm -hmm. um, knew nothing about a three song rule. Was, uh, was all like, what do you mean I only get three songs? I thought I get to shoot everything. But when they do Mrs. Pollard's Lullaby and it's an eight minute, eight and a half minute song and you get you know, three full songs, it wasn't that bad. Right. <laughs> so. Well, how do you feel about, uh, you know, I've been fortunate that, uh, you know, when I shoot mostly it's for a major publication or whatnot, I, I can refuse to sign these contracts that, that they're trying to make people sign these yeah. days, which are, you know, utter bullshit. They're, yeah. Um, they want to take your rights to your photos and tell you that uh, you, they can use your photos and you can't use your photos. Right, and, and if they reach out to you, you have to send them everything and... No, it would, so what do I think about Yeah, it? what do you think about that? Well, when, I, when they... Or how do you approach, or how do you deal with that? If I start drawing lines on the contract and crossing out things that I don't agree with, mm -hmm. And usually the publicist and the people that are giving it to you, if they give it to you on the day of the location, uh, they never read it. That's true, they just So kinda... you can, Jim Marshall told me that, oh no, Jim Marshall didn't tell me this. Um, oh, what's his name? Robert Knight mm -hmm. told me that he used to sign Jim Marshall's name. Oh. So he would basically <laughs> sign something. They don't know. Or Mickey Mouse, yeah. Right, you signed some fictitious thing. I put a fake email down there. Nice. I know I probably shouldn't share all that information, but these days I'll, I'll that looks good, thank you. Um, I cross it out, or I don't sign it at all, or you just, you just, uh, well, I, mean, I had it's, some, it's hard for a, 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 kid. a kid or someone who oh, doesn't yeah. really know the, the system. They just sign it away and just think, oh, I'm gonna get in there and do it. But it's really important uh, for photographers to, to keep their rights uh, and whatnot. Well, yeah, yeah, and when I talked to uh, Bob Gruen, we talked about the three song rules, we talked about all that stuff and he, he was so against it at this point. But signing contracts, thank you. He's like, I, I don't, he's like, he's like, I wish back in the day that somebody would have offered me f like 10, 15 grand as a buyout because then I wouldn't have, you know, I would have just sold them everything. He was telling a story that Guns N' Roses in the 90s, you could shoot a roll of slide film, you would give them the roll with the, uh, how you would process it, you know, plus, minus, whatever, however you wanted them to do it. Mm -hmm. They would pick one frame from it and send you that one frame. Wow. So I've, I've encountered a couple of things, like Kesha had a, a press release or a, one of those things. I just crossed out the, no, I will not give you all the rights to everything, and they never read it. And, and it's not the artist. We know right. it's not the artist. Right. The artists just want to do their stuff. It's the management, and they're, and they're trying to, I saw one really bad one that the reader sent in to me and it, he's like, should I sign this? I'm like, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. It was like, you will send us this and you have no rights. It's like, F you. Can I curse? You can curse. It's like, F you. What? Yeah. I know, I do it first every time and then, and then ask. But no, it's just, that's when it, it's bad, bad. Right. Well, why don't we take a, a quick break okay. and uh, have some food here so okay. we're not too distracted. 
All right, so uh, we're back. Jared's still got a few pieces of sushi in front of him, but uh, we had to take a uh, feed our face break. Mm -hmm. uh, how was it? Did you like it? Yeah, very good. Good stuff. Oh, I love sushi. I'd eat this stuff just about every day. Come Any out better here. than uh, Philly? There's a lot more here. <laughs> it's filled up more. But my stuff in Philly is pretty good, so hopefully if they're listening... Do you get the, uh, the the kind with the, the cream cheese inside it? No, I will not do a Philly yeah. roll. I don't I, like cream cheese. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of those. I do like, you know, the bagel and cream cheese, you know, type thing, but not on Bagel sushi. and schmear? Bagel with and some, schmear. Uh, some lox and schmear? Lox and schmear. That's exactly what I like. Yeah. So anyway, we were talking about uh, the music industry. Uh, you ended up uh, getting out of uh, the sports because uh, you kind of got tired of it yeah. into the music industry and, and over lunch we were kind of talking about uh, how it's sort of a, a difficult uh, industry because A, we were talking about the uh, the contracts. They oh, try that's to make what we were talking about, yeah, contracts. Yeah, contracts. Um, and, and beyond that, uh, it's just, uh, you know, if you're working with a band, you're not working necessarily with the artists themselves, you're, you're having to deal with the management. It's, yeah. it's not the artists that are the, the pains and the asses. Well, sometimes they are, they can be divas. But they can be divas, but they give you the access to do what you want, and they don't care. Right. They don't care about, you know, the three song rule. They don't care about that stuff. Yeah. Um, so, uh, anyhow, let's, let's, get, let's move into Frono's photo. I, l let me tell you a quick story. I, I, uh, I first saw, you know, I didn't know who you were at the point, but I knew about your t-shirts and I had actually ordered one. This is probably five years ago or something at this point. Did you know. really? Yeah, I, I was one of the original black ones. I still got it. Does it have a TM on it or not? I, I don't have to I'll Go have to check. Look. If it doesn't have a TM, you have an original shirt. I can sell it for a lot of money on eBay. Lots of money, because it was one of the early runs that I packed myself, filled out every single envelope, sealed it. I wonder how I found it. I think it was like just a Facebook post or something. Oh, I'm like, oh, that's been. fucking hilarious because, uh, you know, I, at that point, there were so many of my friends, professionals, who refused to shoot raw. And I could not believe it. You know, oh, they want to save on their file size. Oh, it adds, you know, extra process and they stuff. They get it right in the camera. Yeah. <laughs> which is still the worst excuse in the history of excuses. With What, I don't try to get it right in the camera? Right. It has nothing to do with that. But we don't even need to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, unless you want to. Well, I mean, so, so that's how the I shoot raw. It was for, before your photos photo. It was, you started the, no. the t-shirt? No, photos photo first. Oh, okay. Uh, and then slogan was I shoot raw came up and then started pumping out t-shirts because I knew merch uh -huh. was important. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in and look, I run a free photography website, mm -hmm. and I knew early on that you have to monetize some way or another. Right. To keep doing what you need to do mm -hmm. because it's not like companies come along to send you a ton of money. Drinking beer, Steven? Steven's drinking beer, all right. All right, anyway, but it's not like they, they just throw money and you make a ton of money at it. it. It's a lot of work. I spent 12 to 15 hours a day for two straight years just creating stuff and, and getting it to where we were going or where I was going. Right. Um, where was the question going? Oh, yes, monetizing. Monetizing. 10 days after I launched my site, June 1st, uh -huh. was uh, 2010 when I launched it, I had a t-shirt and the t-shirt sold for $11.99 probably cost me eight bucks to make. Mm -hmm. I took the time myself to, 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 to write the labels, to ship them, to take them to the post office. I did everything. And all the money that I made from that filtered right back into the business. Everything was, it wasn't like I was trying to make a ton of money at it. It was just trying to sustain myself so that I can continue on and try to make a go at what I was doing. And, and when I initially started, it wasn't to make money. It was just to, I thought originally that I would create a website where I showcased my work mm -hmm. and I teach other people and I'd get jobs from that. Yeah. I'd have big name clients calling me. What, what ended up happening was beginners started to come along and ask more questions and then I realized that these guys want tutorials, they want, they want to learn, they want to have what I've created as a professional, they want to know that stuff. Right. And the old me would have been like, I'm not giving away any secrets. Mm -hmm. I'm not giving you anything because I'm not successful enough to, to give this stuff away, you're gonna take jobs from me. And then you get to the point and you're like, those people aren't you. They don't have your eye. You have your way of doing things. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with helping other people out. And it turns into a business. It does. It just happens. And if you're not, if, if you know, you have to be prepared to pivot. Like Gary Vaynerchuk, you know Gary Vee? I don't know Gary Vee. All right, he's big internet marketer guy. And we, we've talked about this stuff. And he's like, you were smart enough to know that you needed to pivot. I could have gone down the road thinking I'd get jobs or I could have pivoted and gone to where these clientele, where the readership was taking it. Mm -hmm. 
and that was the smarter move to make. I make tutorials and, you know, it, it continues to be free for, yeah. all, for 1,500 videos. Yeah. Uh, I do sell other things like... A, a There's a lot of really great information. I mean, even like <clears throat> you were one of the de deciding factors for me getting that little Rode uh, lav in your iPhone mic. Oh, which the is smart cool, lab. The smart lab. They'll be is, happy to hear that. Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, I actually, you know, it's funny. I, I someone had posted a link to it online, <clears throat> and then I looked up review, and you popped up first. And of course, See, that's called brand freaking awareness. Yeah, no, and these advertisers, <clears throat> they don't get that. Yeah, and, and and I really, what I really enjoyed about what you did is you gave a real like, this is with this microphone, this is with that microphone, and it was like, okay, and I'm listening with my headset so I can really hear the difference. And uh, for someone like me, uh, you know, where I'm just recording on a Zoom H4n with two labs, you know, I see your setup, you've got these you know, beautiful mics, this whole setup, which is really great. Um, it's really good to, to actually see and hear the difference between what these microphones do. Sure. And I think that that particular microphone, is, though I haven't really used it much yet, um, is going to come in handy in those last minute, like... It, it honestly wasn't far off from our Sony wireless, uh, our Sony wireless packs. It really wasn't. What you're, what you're paying for in a wireless pack is the ability to send that signal from here to the camera. Right. And they're, they're robust. This smart lab, I believe it's 69 bucks or something mm -hmm. like that. Just to plug into your iPhone and have that ability is pretty damn cool. Yeah, absolutely. With some quality, because we know audio is damn important. Right. Why am I saying damn so much? I well, don't know. You know, that's what you got to do. Um, so uh, now let's talk a little bit about, about the Fro itself. I, you know, I read up a little bit, and this was actually sort of a memento to your mother, the, the, the whole Fro. Um, partly, yeah. Partly. Can you, can you talk about that a little yeah. bit? Yeah. Yeah, the hair, I started growing just to grow. I was on tour with Perry Farrell, and that was the last time I had my hair cut. I had a shaved head when I went out, and that was in 2007, so it's been six years six and a half years of just letting it grow. So I grew it uh, as a Jewish guy, boy, young man, whenever mm -hmm. I was, we have curly hair, so we, it gets awkward at a certain point. Like mm -hmm. four months in, my mom would always take me to get a haircut, you know, and because you have to keep it under wraps. Right. Uh, so I just let it go for once. And it was awkward three, four, five months in. And then by a year in, it had that awesome round basketball look and, mm -hmm. and it was great. And and I, my mom got, she got sick. She was diagnosed with cancer and and we said if she lost her hair, that we would shave, I'd take my hair and we'd make it a wig. Mm -hmm. She never lost her hair, which was which was good, but she lost her life instead. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah, sorry, so I didn't that's, mean to uh, you up. No, it, it's, it's reality. Yeah. So that was part of the reason for uh, the hair and I kept it. A lot of people shave their head at that point and you know, as a, a remembrance thing and I just like, I continue on because she just would have wanted me to do what I wanted. She knew I danced to the beat of my own drummer anyway, so. Do you so feel the need that. to keep it now because of the, the website and, the, and it's your brand at this point? Somewhat, yeah. but I don't not like it. Yeah. You know, if I didn't like it, then I would get rid of it. It's not a problem. You know what I think you should do before thinking of getting rid of it is corn rowing it. Corn row, every sister <laughs> that I walk by on the street wants to corn row my hair. So I believe it's sister. Sorry, sister, <laughs> my bad. But no, that's uh, the hair was, you know, there's so many different that was one of the aspects of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's awesome. So I, I guess going back to the blogging, you know, you know, in the same vein, you know, I started Photo Brigade. And the reason why is I started seeing all these collectives out there, uh, groups of photographers uh, bringing their social media presences together and then under a different name promoting their work. Yeah. And I, and I was thinking, well, dang, you know, I kind of wish I was part of one of these because it's at one, at some point you kind of get you look pompous constantly promoting your own work on Facebook and whatnot. Yeah. So I, I created Photo Brigade on, on Facebook. So what are you trying to say? No, I'm not saying. What are you trying to say? That I'm not pompous? Saying, no, no. Some it's people not will tell you it's true. <laughs> You're one of a kind, Jared. Um, no, but but what I'm what I'm saying is uh, that I started it this way, and it's turned into a whole sort of, uh, I guess, community um, yeah. and learning resource for photographers, and mainly a resource for freelance photographers to really uh, get a handle and, and get their work seen to a, a larger audience. Um, and as it's grown, it's become something different. Obviously, you want to try to monetize it and make uh, you know connections with different companies and whatnot. Um, do you, and, and it's also become a, a, a full-time job almost. It, it's, and it I, is a full-time job. And as a photographer myself, like you are, you know, I, I see it taking a lot of my time away. And, and I, and you put out, you constantly are putting out more than we are. Yeah. Uh, and you have, 
like like you were just uh, I don't know if we can say where you you can say you were just at Joey L's yeah uh, doing a, a podcast and you came into the sushi place with you know tons of gear. Oh, we shoot it with we shoot the pod, my podcast with four cameras, three DSLRs and a, and a GoPro for the wide shot. We have the road mics that we bring up with us, and I brought panel lights because. It can't just sound good, it's got to look good yeah. as well. Or it has to sound good. As a podcast, it has to be good. Right. We're, we're sitting here in person because Skype isn't personal. Right. You know, right. Though I would have loved to have do, done it, but... We can do our it, next one over Skype. It's just, Skype is so... Fi- that was when I, when I started my podcast, not to go off on tangents. It was, what can I do that's different? And everything that I've done in my life has been, what can I do that's different that other people aren't doing? Right. Whether it's right or wrong, I just don't want to be the same as everybody else. And, and it was just create a podcast that wasn't boring, that wasn't just straight up gear talk, that was just real, mm-hmm. that you interviewed people in person, you made it look good, and you made it sound good. Because mm-hmm. podcasts generally aren't filmed. Right. But I have a big YouTube following, and I thought it would be stupid to not engage them. Yeah. Yes, there's the people that just listen to the podcast on their phone, but then there's the people that want to sit there and watch it on their Apple TV. Yeah, that's true. And, and I've really started using the Apple TV a whole lot more. Um, and uh, then there's all the podcast servers and whatnot. Um, so, you know, it, I guess my question <laughs> before you I'm went sorry, off on your tangents, sorry, on tangents. Was, was like, how much has your website taken away from your photography? Because at first it was, you know, built to uh-huh. grow well, your photography work and your clientele. Yeah. But it seems like, and I mean, obviously you're making a living employing some people and, and whatnot, which is awesome. But has it taken away from uh, your, your photography I, business? I, I don't think it's taken away because what I don't think most people realize is that I I never considered myself to fully have made it as a photographer. Though they'll tell you you shot for Rolling Stone and you've done all this and you've toured with these people. I want I always want more. Sure, yeah. You know those Joey L big corporate jobs. You know you want yeah. you want to do that stuff. Just one. Just but for, one. <laughs> but for some people that may not be the path and it may not be what you do. Like shooting for Rolling Stone sounds good. Mm-hmm. Never paid well, right. and you know that shooting musicians doesn't exactly uh, pay well until you get in with a band, and then there's actually some possibility for it. But you know the site takes a lot of time, but I've done such an interesting job uh, creating enough content and being able to have it uh, organized in such a way that I can go away. Like I was in in LA doing a shoot with Modest Yahoo for a couple days. Mm-hmm. I'm still able to take an hour at night and sit there and program what I need to get done for tomorrow for the, the website, put up a video that's already preloaded on the YouTube just waiting for me to turn it on. So I've come up with a style or a, a, a method of doing things right. that there's content, there's 20 <clears throat> videos sitting there waiting for me right now. And you know, Steven, who's sitting with me here, has been a great help to what I do. He can edit video, he can shoot video, he knows the audio, uh, he can put it up on YouTube for me so it's waiting. And then I, I go in there and I, the goal is to preload the, all the content, like exp- do the whole description, all the tags and all the, all the titles, so that when I'm ready to turn the video on, I just copy that over to my website and everything's basically ready to go. So I've come up with a formula that works for me. Right. Um, has it taken away from photography? I love marketing, I love branding, I love creating, and it's all a little bit of everything in my site. And I also think what's really cool about the website is that it's, it's connected so many people. Um, That's, for instance, us. Yeah. And uh, I think that I, I finally, I saw you at Photo, Photo Plus. Plus and just tapped, I was like, oh yeah, he's the yeah. throw guy, I'll tap on his shoulder. Yep. I, think, I think a couple uh, Photo Pluses ago, I saw you and just Instagrammed your, your fro. Yeah, those shows are fun <laughs> to walk around. I get stopped quite often yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I even got stopped at AVN too. Oh yeah? I had 11 fro readers stop me at AVN. That's cool. Yeah. Famous. Do you get stopped walking down the street at all, or is that sometimes? Sometimes. It's it's just weird because especially when you're with friends and they're like, "Who the f- are you?" <laughs> uh, prime example. I was shooting Modest in L.A. and we were out at Santa Monica at the pier, and I'm sitting there taking pictures of him. Somebody walks by and goes, "Frono's photo," <laughs> and then we walk into a hotel, and somebody's sitting there having lunch, going, "Fro." Oh my God! And this is modest, you know. I'm with a guy that sold out al- tons of albums right. and toured the world. And he's like, his manager looked at me and goes, "Who the f- are you?" You know? And it was just, it, it's amazing. And my dad's amazed. My dad's so excited. Like when I go out and and uh, we we were at dinner one night and these two ladies walked by and they're like, "Oh my God, it's the fro." My dad's like. I'm the fro's father. <laughs> I'm the fro. Yeah. I came from my sperm. And the lady goes, you have good sperm, sir. <laughs> well, at least give some... She was a sister. Hair. Oh, she was a sister. Yeah, yeah. Does, is your dad bald? Does he have, still have a full head He's of hair? He's balding. Oh. He's got the bald spot. I think I got the uh, 
the good mm. the good hair gene. Oh yeah, I think so. You were you were mentioning about your mother and the whole cutting it off uh, thing, but what what that reminded me of is one of my good friends when we were in high school. He dreadlocked his hair, mm. and his mother is an art teacher. And uh, when he finally shaved it off, what she ended up doing with it was keeping the dreads and and sewed it onto one of these, you know, beanie hats yeah. so that he can still walk around oh, with the dreads cool. if he wants. Yeah. <laughs> so there's an idea for you, right? For the future. For the future, when when maybe your dad's genes kick in. Yeah, at some point, I'm it. sure everybody tells me, I had hair like you in the 70s. <laughs> like, great. Well, uh, is there anything else uh, going going on in the industry that's... Uh, that uh, is worth worth a chat. I don't know. Well, it's an interesting in industry. Yeah. There's a lot of people trying to do what we do, mm -hmm. uh, which is nothing wrong. I mean, I tell anybody, if you want to start a YouTube channel, there's nothing holding you back. Yeah. There's no better time than now to do something. Get it started. You just have if to you be make unique. it, they will come. Yeah. Well, you you have to you have to be focused. You have to know what you're doing. You have to you, you know you can only act as if for so long, right? Mm -hmm. You can you can play the part, but if you can't back it up. It's like in the internet marketing world, if you've ever been around there, they tell you you can, you can exploit any niche market. Doesn't matter if you're passionate about it because all you need to do is follow this model. Mm -hmm. If I'm not passionate about something, I'm not doing it. Yeah. So, you know, so anybody out there can, can make it. Yeah. You, just have to, you just have to bust your freaking ass and you catch some breaks sometimes. It's an, it's, I think it's super important for people to, to be blogging these days. I mean, as a photographer, you are marketing and branding yourself. You can't just take pictures today and let them sit on your desktop. They have to go out into the world. Right. And then you can't be worried about people stealing them. Mm -hmm. Because if you worry about that, then the quality of your work isn't going to come out because you have a big-ass watermark in front of it. And at least that's my opinion, is that just get your stuff out there. Flickr is tied in with Getty. Not that they pay you very much, but you get seen. We, there's the kid that was shooting the Coca-Cola bottles and he ended up posting it in the, there's a Coca-Cola forum or something on Flickr, mm -hmm. a group, and then Coca-Cola contacted him and was like, we love what you do, will you head up this group? Then he headed up this group and then they're like, we want you to head up social media for Instagram for us and then we want you to travel around the world with the FIFA World Cup tour hmm. and take all the pictures for us. Wow because he took pictures of a Coke bottles and that's what he was passionate internet. about, put it out there on the internet and it came back to him. How, how do you feel about uh, you know, Instagram and uh, all these different, you know, Facebook and their terms of services and, and I stuff? I don't give a shit <laughs> about their terms of services. Seriously, if you're gonna, Instagram is a free app. Facebook is a free thing. Mm -hmm. If you put as much, if you put no information on Facebook, Facebook wouldn't have any information. Mm -hmm. That's why when they say, what movies do you like? If you sit there and put that in there, you're asking for, to be advertised to. Right. And I don't, it's a, it's a, it's a cause and effect. I'm getting, it's a, it's one of those relationships. I'm getting something from them and they're getting something from me. Mm -hmm. it, it's mutually beneficial. Like YouTube, YouTube pays you to put up videos. Well, they don't pay you directly, but they pay you an advertising. Right. Based on so them, yeah. they get, I think they get like, 26%. It's not even that bad. Mm -hmm. It's a great split. Or maybe mm -hmm. I get like 82. That is like almost 26%. I get, I get 80. I don't even know what it is. But, but they, the, the fact that I say this all the time is that basically YouTube is, is paying me to create ads for myself. Mm -hmm. every, video I put, every video I put up doesn't cost me money. It's a free advertisement for my brand. Right. So anybody can do that because YouTube is free. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where the hell I was going with any of this. Well, we were talking about terms of service. And you oh, were, terms and you of were, service. And you were kind of thinking that, uh, you know, in terms of Facebook well, and Instagram, that you, you benefit uh, equally as much as... If you get a following on Instagram and you've built up from nothing, because there's people that have hundreds of thousands of followers legitimately that end up getting jobs for corporate people right. or getting flown to places because of their Instagram. Yeah. Now, if they didn't share their work and worried about terms of services, nobody would have ever seen their work and they'd still, still be sitting at home doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Or maybe not doing nothing, but that's the, the point is, you put it out into the world, their terms of service, Facebook is not gonna sell your photos. Instagram is not gonna sell your photos. You Hopefully don't, not. You think? Well, I mean, uh, I hope not. I, I mean, the... the, the the, I would if they were if they were going to I'd hope that you know there'd be some sort of cut but the fact is is that they could well you could as long as you have an opt out but I, again it's a free app it's your choice not to use it right. you either like the because I've that, seen and that's I've, the hard thing is that uh, you know so many people use it and uh, it's almost like you don't exist if you're not on these apps well I've seen well known photographers that I'm friends with decide to jump off of it because they weren't they weren't 
happy with the terms of service. So they would go on to some other service where nobody's at. If nobody's there, then nobody's paying attention to your work. So are you better off using it as a platform to get a bigger following and that turn, there's people, you can get jobs from Instagram, real legitimate jobs. Is that worth it if they do decide to sell your photo? In the random case where they decide to use it for advertising or something, which is pretty much unheard of now, right now, was it worth it to make those connections and those jobs? Did you make money off of it? Well, I think it's a case by case, really. I mean, uh, for, for folks maybe like, like yourself that have, have a big following, you have a much more, uh, bigger chance to... But I started with nothing. That's true. It comes from, I had zero subscribers when I started. Mm -hmm. I had zero Instagram followers. I don't even have that many. I got like 18,000. Mm -hmm. And that's, I guess, a lot. But when you look at what these other people have and they've got millions of Instagram followers, you suddenly go, holy Jesus. The key is to be a uh, young woman taking selfies of yourself to get a lot of followers, I believe. Uh, well, I have pictures of me in dresses on Instagram. Oh. Wow. That's picked up the wrong people, but still, <laughs> nah, whatever. It's, yeah. it's all in good fun. Well, my cat uh, officially has a uh, Instagram meow underscore chicken, so. Meow underscore chicken. Yeah, it's pretty good. Very nice. Yeah. Um, well, good. Uh, well, I think that I know you've got a, a, a train to catch. Back train to, to catch. Uh, back to Philly. Back to Philly. I really appreciate you coming and uh, having this little interview no sushi sushi fest with me. Can I tell people where to listen to my podcast Absolutely. if they That's would was, like? That was the next thing. I'd like you to give, give all your information. Okay. If you would like to listen to a different style, I like your podcast, by the way. <laughs> it's not boring. It's not the, uh, I won't put out names. It's not just straight up gear talk. It's nice conversations, which are great. Uh, I have a, a podcast called Fronos Photo Raw Talk. You can go to fronosphoto.com slash podcast or just look up Raw Talk on iTunes, Stitcher, or anywhere else. And it's uh, audio. Mm -hmm. You also have the ability to watch it li uh, on YouTube, not live, but you have the ability to watch a, it's either an hour, an hour and a half worth, however long we're doing it, and we shoot it with three cameras. It's like a TV show. Yeah. So you can, you can what, four cameras, Steven? Four cameras. As a matter of fact, on my way walking down here, I was watching it on my phone, just catching up with the latest episode. Which there you is go. Pretty cool. These so that works. You can do that. Yeah. Um, I, sh I should also mention, uh, last time uh, we were, you were at Photo Plus. You were actually hired by Photo Plus to like That's two years ago. Two years ago, they've since <laughs> me. <laughs> they didn't me. They okay. got sold. Oh, did they? They got sold, and the new people coming in were so close-minded. They wanted me to pay to film to create content for them. Oh Jesus! I was like, wait, was it? The Sounds guy, like the music industry to me. They <laughs> called me on the phone legitimately, and this isn't me sound being an asshole. This is this is kind of like business thing. Yeah. They called me and were like. We loved it, and they loved what we did, which didn't ask them for money. Just give me a booth and give me connection to the internet, and we were gonna do this. I'm basically creating all this content to make you look better to help you sell booths. But it makes me look better because I'm creating all this stuff and interviewing these people. They came back to me the next year and they're like, so what we're thinking is uh, that you could make this content. You, could, we'll, you pay us for a booth. You pay us for a booth, we're not gonna give you anything and then we can use the content. I'm like, that is the dumbest thing. I shot the guy down so quick, and I try not to be a dick because I have a tendency to be a dick. Be. But then the guy called me back a couple months later, do you think we could do a trade? You know, we just need a quick video, a, a showcase, like a trailer. I'm like, F you. And then I called my people over there, that, that, because these were the new people. I'm like, dude, this guy just called me and asked me to do this. I'm like, I don't think so. Yeah. I'm like, you give me a booth, I will create content, which then makes you look good. Right. Anyway, that's just, it, it's nice when you can be in a position to put somebody in their place every once in a while when it's legitimate. Right. And I'm not worried that they're not gonna hire me because they're not gonna hire me for that stuff again. But guess what? I can still show up to Photo Plus myself on a media credential and do whatever the hell I want, mm -hmm. wear handcuffs inside the booth if I want to, which I did, <laughs> and just, we can just do whatever we want. It's yeah. just not as formal as I just wanted to bring them on board. Yeah. So. Well, anyway, that was an interesting, uh, interesting story. I can't believe that they did that, and that's uh, ridiculous. And I'm glad that you said no. You know, that's the important thing about knowing business is when to say no, and apparently a good f you too. So I didn't tell him to go f himself. I just because uh, I, I, this is just to help help the ratings I, I, of this podcast. Well, no, I, it's what <laughs> I wanted. To, I said it in a more cordial way, but a more like no way in hell, dude. You got it. You are just so far off base. It's not because I can't be a total dick all the time. Right. Just partial. Right. Circumcised. <laughs> Circumcised. Wait. And 
TMI right there. Um, with the fro below? <laughs> the fro below. <laughs> People want to know. Is there one? <laughs> we'll leave that to my videos that I almost, anyway, had a malfunction in one in a bathtub. Oh, you, you did a video in a bathtub? In Vegas. It was a crib style edition of my suite. One of the readers, one of my readers works for somewhere. They upgraded my room without me knowing. Oh, wow. Scary that they looked up my information and then upgraded my room. But I had a suite, so we did a whole tour of it, and I was in the bathtub. I taped two small towels to myself with gaff tape, and I sat in the bathtub, and one of them started to float away, so I quickly <laughs> grabbed it. And anyway, just weird stuff. And again, we didn't even talk about that. That's, that's one of the reasons that I've picked up so many followers, is that it's different. Uh -huh. it's, it's off base. Quirky. Well, yeah, it's, quirky, it's, it's, like Steven it's said. very quirky, and, and I remember when I was thinking about starting a podcast, because it's something I've been interested in recording, even when I was a kid, I had tapes of me and my family talking on the, yeah. on the tape recorder and everything. But uh, I remember looking it up, I was on a plane going from somewhere and I just downloaded a couple of your podcasts. And you know, immediately when you start up your podcast, you know, you, you just have a big grin because you're, you're so silly on it. You yeah. know? It's, it's good stuff. But as long as you can back it up, you're good. As long as you and can I'll back let you it finish. up. I'll let you wrap it up. All right, well that's it. Uh, everyone else can uh, find us on photobrigade.com and uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at photobrigade. Thanks, Jared. I Thank really you. appreciate it. And uh, next time, we'll have to grab a, a drink when we're in town. Sounds Thanks like you'd be soosh. a fun drinking buddy. I don't drink very much. Well, I've seen you on your podcast drink. <laughs> I, that was once. Some I had vodka. one vodka and lemonade, vodka and apple juice. Oh. Well, I guess I'm, I a, copy I'm not a big episode. drinker. All right. All right, we'll figure out something to do. Sure. All right. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. No problem. Cheers, Thank buddy. You. So there you have it. That was the interview conducted by Robert Kaplan of me which I like in the interview. I love talking, as you guys can tell, but this was something I didn't want to leave you hanging without a raw talk, and we've been saving this bad boy for a little bit of time so that we would have it just in case or for that time where I'm not around to go ahead and make you guys a Fronos Photo raw talk. So I, I know it's a little different. A lot of you guys like watching the raw talk as well as listening, but I hope you enjoyed looking at the Fronos Photo logo while you were watching. But anyway, really good interview. Robert did a fantastic job, and I thought the information in it was extremely strong to share with you guys to give you a different feel usually I'm interviewing somebody in this case I was the interview e -E -E, getting interviewed by mr. Robert Kaplan of the photo brigade so we're gonna get back on task next week we'll have another Fronos photo raw talk for you that is new as long as I survived Israel uh, I'm gonna knock on some wood I'm gonna knock on some wood so hopefully I'm I'm alive I hope I'm alive, because if I'm not alive, then there won't be another Raw Talk, and you guys will be like, oh, he died while talking. Uh, he kind of hurt himself. Kind of hurt is a Yiddish thing. You don't really want to get into that. That's just like, you jinx yourself. It's like a black hat statement. Ba okay, I take it back. I want to live. I want to live, all right? I just want to be alive. I want to be alive because I want to do more Raw Talks and share them with you. So next week, back, hopefully, Raw Talk 86 coming up. That's Raw Talk number 85, Jared Polin Frono photo.com. See ya.